Hello, my name is Russell Swanson, and this is the seventh lecture in a 20-part lecture series on the history of ethics. In this lecture, I'll be focusing on hedonist philosophy from ancient Greece, and in particular, the earliest known expression of hedonist philosophy uh, via the Cyrenaic philosopher Aristippus. Um, in this and the next lecture, I'll, I'll be focusing on hedonism. So I'd like to start off today by talking a little bit about hedonism in general, and then my strategy will be to talk about uh, the teaching specifically attributed to Aristippus the Elder from Cyrene, and then in my next lecture I'll focus on the refinements of this teaching that are attributed to um, the philosopher from Samos, uh, Epicurus, who also came to Athens at some point in his life and ended up founding a school there. Um, but again, my, my strategy to start will be to talk about this sort of umbrella term called hedonism and what will apply to both the early hedonists, the followers of Aristippus, often called the Cyrenaics, and then the later hedonists, the followers of Epicurus, sometimes just called the Epicureans. Um, okay, so hedonism, generally speaking, uh, is a term that, you know, you may have heard of and is a term that um, you don't really have to do a lot of work. We often do in this kind of study to sort of get our thoughts out of the way so we can understand terms in a different way. If you've heard the, the term hedonism before, you've probably heard of it in such a way that it is consistent with how it is used generally as an ethical philosophy. Um, the basic idea is that uh, the good of life is the enjoyment of life. Um, and, you know, I'm just putting it very simply there to start off with. And, and I think maybe more than ever, in terms of what we've studied, the best way to start studying hedonism is to think about its metaphysics, the metaphysics that seems to be behind any hedonist ethical philosophy. Uh, recall this is a move, a theme, right, that we're seeing amongst the, the most influential thinkers of history, that their ethical thoughts are sort of grounded in their, in their metaphysical thoughts. You know, Plato's vision of a transcendent good is obviously grounded in his dualistic metaphysics of the physical and cultural world and the world outside, outside the cave, the non-physical permanent world of forms. Aristotle's vision of flourishing as a human being sort of very much grounded in his vision of the natural world. Uh, and I called Aristotle in my earlier lecture in the series kind of a down-to-earth thinker. I'd like to say that in many respects, the hedonists, you know, sort of out down-to-earth even Aristotle, right? They are going to be the most down-to-earth uh, thinkers that we will get the chance to explore together. And uh, so, um, in particular, the way to understand what I'm describing as this sort of down-to-earth quality is to explore their visions uh, or their thoughts about the nature of reality and namely their metaphysics. They actually have a metaphysics that we call materialism. Okay, now that word we probably need to work on a little bit because when I say materialism, most of my 21st century students or listeners might be thinking of sort of uh, being overly consumed with uh, consumer goods, let's say. And that's not an incorrect use of the word materialism. It's not an incorrect use of the word, uh, the adjective being materialistic. However, that is sort of a derivative of the deeper philosophical and, and metaphysical meaning of the term materialism, which states, if I put it very simply, that reality is material. Plain and simple, reality is physical, and that there is nothing knowable about reality that is beyond the physical, beyond what we can sense in reality. Um, you might think this sounds a lot like, if you're following this lecture series, the naturalistic metaphysics of Aristotle. There's a subtle but important difference there. I've said here that the metaphysics of the hedonist is called materialism, and I've made the claim that that means that the only thing that is real is the physical, is the material level of reality, and that is, you're right, a kind of a monism, a kind of a oneism with regard to the structure of reality, which does echo the Aristotelian. However, remember that Aristotle's conception of reality was what we called teleological. 
And in that sense and others, Aristotle claims that the natural world is made up of matter, but also form and purposes all built into this one layer of reality. And that very much informs his, uh, his ethical philosophy as well, particularly his teleological conception of reality very much informs the Aristotelian ethics, right? Because his whole question in the Nicomachean ethics was to figure out what is the purpose of human life. And that was the strategy for trying to figure out how to make the most of having a human life. But here, what we're seeing is a, a really stripped down metaphysical notion that, that actually goes back hundreds of years prior to the earliest known uh, hedonist philosophers, going back to thinkers like Democritus, who argued, another ancient Greek thinker, who argued that reality is purely physical, and in fact, this physical or material reality is made up of simple atomic elements, literally atoms, right? Like this is where we get our concept of the atom from, the Democritian um, uh, uh, philosophy of materialism and atomism, right? The theory that physical reality is all there is and physical reality is made up of imperceptibly small, so small you can't see them, chunks of material reality called atoms. It's a little bit, right, that should be a little bit interesting to note that 2,500 years ago, there was a theory of atoms in ancient Greek philosophy. It's, I think, pretty impressive in many respects. In, in one sense, that'll turn out to be wrong, right, At, in, in the sense that um, for Democritus and the material, early materialists, these chunks, these basic building block chunks of reality, the, that which they called atoms, were, um, were indestructible and unbreakable, and they were sort of the, again, the basic building block of reality. There was nothing smaller than that out of which reality was made. That, again, turns out to be something that we'll call into question in our uh, contemporary uh, quantum mechanics and in our, uh, our physics of the subatomic realm. However, still, right, give them their due. 2,500 years ago, long before the electron microscope, we've got a theory of imperceptibly small chunks of matter called atoms. Um, and this is what the hedonist philosophers take on as their view of reality. And I just want to spell out a couple of implications of this. What, what, uh, what we'll find here amongst the materialists and particularly the hedonist philosophers is that you know, this means that there is no purpose, right? No telos uh, in the purely physical reality. And so that's not going to be the way that they approach the question of how to have a good human life. Um, and that there is no knowable uh, continuation after one dies. When one dies, um, as Epicurus will, will put it, uh, some particularly refined and small atoms that maybe are identified with the life force or the psyche or the soul, simply dissipate and separate from the more coarse atoms of the, of the body. And then all of it just sort of dissipates and breaks down over time. And so when you die, uh, for the materialist philosophers, you're done. That's it. And so this really puts a focus on, okay, if there's no purpose and when you die, you're just done, then what is the goal of existence? Well, as we said to start off with, for the hedonist philosophers, the goal of existence in what they conceive of as a purely physical reality will be to simply, you know, take this, you know, amazing physiological complexity that somehow allows us to feel and be conscious of our physical existence, and then just try to feel it in a way that hurts as little as possible. Try to live your life in such a way that we minimize the pains of existence and perhaps maximize our opportunities for the pleasures of existence. And, and this is, again, a kind of a, a, a almost deceptively simple teaching about life that I'm going to guess for many of you won't sound too crazy in terms of its basic claims. And there's a reason for that. And I want you to put a pin in this. When in the later parts of this lecture series, we talk about 
the reemergence of Greek philosophy and the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and the emergence of the scientific worldview, I just want you to note that this will be one of the Greek ideas that really stands the test of time well. And so there's a sense in which hedonist attitudes towards existence, whether we know the vocabulary of ancient Greek hedonism or not, are going to sound culturally pretty familiar even in the 21st century. And my argument for that is that in some sense what we're seeing is that hedonist uh, ideas of existence are, are fairly natural to arrive at if we see reality in the way that later science sees reality, or if we see reality in the way that these ancient materialist uh, metaphysicians saw reality. Um, so to, to spell this out just a little bit more before I dive off into the specifics of, of the earliest known versions of this teaching, um, I just want to sort of underline again what I referred to as the sort of almost deceptive simplicity of this teaching. Um, and the idea here, right, is, and again, this will be important for understanding, you know, modernity and, and modern thought and ethics and morality as well, that for the ancient materialist and for the hedonist in particular, if life is purely physical, then there is no good and bad present within physical reality, except insofar as some creatures seem to have some kind of miraculous almost combination of physicality that allows for the conscious or what we might call the sentient experience of existence. And because some creatures, including us, have this capacity for sentient existence, and we maybe can't explain why that is the case, but it just is sort of obviously the case, you feel your life as sort of either feeling good or feeling bad. And at the most basic level, we could talk about this as kind of a, a very obviously physical experience of what we would call pleasure and pain. And so good and bad don't exist in purely physical reality, but some purely physical creatures are able to feel their existence in such a way that gives rise to pleasure and pain. And pleasure is something that I like, and pain is something that I don't like. Uh, now that's overly simple, but this is where we'll start. Um, and generally speaking, then, the enjoyable pleasurable experiences of life give rise to the notion of a good life. And the painful, uh, you know, sort of harm, hurtful, uh, uncomfortable experiences of life give rise to the very notion of a bad life. And so the claim here is, a, is again, deceptively simple that that the hedonists, based in their materialist metaphysics, are saying that good and bad, in some sense, don't exist out there in the world. They exist in the experience of the world on the part of certain sentient beings. To use a kind of a simple example that I often use, imagine taking a bite out of a sweet and juicy apple. And because of the way in which our taste buds have evolved to draw us towards these sort of what is it, you know, potential energies embodied in sugars, in fructose, for example, we have an experience when we bite into the, the, the sugar-filled apple of pleasure. And so we say, hmm, that's a good apple. But let's pause and just draw attention to the point here that it's not a good apple. Um, it, it's just an apple, and there are certain chemical properties in the apple, but because of my capacity to process the experience of certain molecules and certain chemical compounds within the apple as pleasurable to me, I somewhat perhaps lazily call the apple good and imagine the apple to sort of contain almost goodness in it. But the apple contains no goodness. The apple contains phys has physical properties based upon the chemistry that the apple contains. Um, and then I experience that chemistry in a way that gives rise to an experience that I like -y, so I call it good. And in this way, goodness and badness through the experience of pain and discomfort come into reality as a sort of a combination of a human sentience and the human capacity for conceptualization. 
And so, uh, again, goodness and badness are not out there in the world. According to hedonists, goodness and badness are found in the experience of pleasure and pain at the most basic level. And uh, then we use language and concepts to give rise to um, what we often then sort of later in a less sophisticated, less nuanced way uh, take as sort of a part of reality and that is good and bad. But the point here is that good and bad's not uh, sort of a naturally existing quality, it is a quality of experience, right? Um, and uh, again, let me dive just a little deeper into the metaphysics of the hedonists generally, what they all share as a sort of attitude towards reality and the notion of a good life before I break off into early and late versions of this teaching. Um, we, we've, we've said in this lecture series many times that the metaphysics of these ancient thinkers, right, ground their ethics and that their metaphysics, their theories of reality often are focused sort of in two directions, focused internally, inwardly, and, and outwardly, and that these are complementary and important sort of two parts of the overarching theory of reality. And so we've said here, something about reality at large, which is that for the hedonist, it's material, it's purely physical. But then let's talk a little bit about their theory of the psyche, their theory of the kind of creature we are. And really, in some sense, I've already implied it. We are a creature that is naturally driven towards these pleasurable experiences and naturally driven away from painful experiences. And so their theory of the psyche is um, is simpler, I would say, in many respects, very much simpler than the Platonic theory and the and the Aristotel Aristotelian theory. In some sense, you know, and I didn't develop this context, but but the two later schools of the four great schools of antiquity, uh, the Garden of Epicurus, which can be associated with uh, hedonist philosophy, and the Stoa uh, of Zeno which will be associated um, with you know, famous, more famous maybe Roman philosophers like Epictetus. But the, the Hedonist school and the Stoic school, which also both emerge in ancient Athens around perhaps the turn of the second century, around 300 BCE, um, these schools are you know, about you know, six, seven, eight, Dec nine decades later than the Platonic and Aristotelian schools. And there's a lot that has shifted around the Mediterranean in this time frame. In particular, um, you know, the Golden Age of Athens sort of come and gone, and the, the Macedonian Empire emerged. And as the Macedonian Empire emerged, it sort of took Greek culture beyond the Greek peninsula and stretched it out sort of around the Mediterranean and particularly all the way over towards India as the Macedonians and under Alexander had taken over the, almost the entirety of the Persian Empire. And in some sense, this is uh, the beginning of what's called the Hellenic or Hellenistic age. And this is sort of the age of the first ever pan-Hellenic, pan-Greek empires. And in some ways, what this does is it, um, it takes Greek culture sort of out of its home and combines it with a lot of other elements. And in many ways, begin, and, and this in this time of, of cultural intermixing and also just the military and economic turmoil of the sort of a rise, the rising of the Macedonian Empire and then the collapse of the Macedonian Empire, what we're gonna see is kind of a, a challenging period for Greek culture. And in some sense, um, you know, we're, we've come a long way almost to the other end of the you know, pendulum swing away from the golden age with which I would sort of a still associate Platonic philosophy and its complexity and Aristotelian philosophy sort of standing on the shoulders of Platonic philosophy as it does. What we're gonna see by the time we get to hedonist philosophy and Stoic philosophy are philosophies that are just in many ways conceptually much simpler. They're philosophies that are sort of just, they're, they're arising out of a time of difficulty and cultural transformation and sort of 
cultural displacement and intermixing. And so they're designed in some ways to be simple sort of interventionist philosophies to help you sort of turn your life around the moment you get a hold of these philosophical notions. And so, you know, there's a little bit of historical context for the emergence of what I'm describing here for you, which is the fairly simple worldview of the hedonists grounded as it is in materialism, which includes then a theory of us, which sort of dispenses with all of the complexities of the Platonic conception of us and the Aristotelian conception of us, and just says, look, we are animals, okay, of course we're sentient and we're more complex and that we live in culture, but in many ways the complexity of human life in culture is not a benefit, it is a distraction from the more basic truth that life is to be enjoyed as much as possible and that we are creatures like most other, like any other sentient animal that really you know, has the opportunity to enjoy life and has the opportunity, unfortunately, to not enjoy life and that it's really sort of that simple. And we should be very suspicious of the complexities of culture which tell the human individual to sacrifice itself for X, Y, and Z religious or cultural reasons or to sort of, you know, uh, to, to try to transcend a simple enjoyment of life. The hedonist philosophers say be very suspicious of that. In fact, the goal is to sort of maybe clean the lenses of perception enough from the cultural uh, conditioning and programming that we've all received within complex societies. Much of that is what allows complex economies to function, but much of that robs the individual of the opportunity to sort of get the simple most out of existence, which is to just enjoy life while you have it. Okay, so this is my attempt to develop a kind of an umbrella understanding of hedonism in general, grounded in materialism, grounded in a kind of a simple psychological theory, and leading to a very simple notion that goodness is tied to pleasure and badness is tied to pain, which leads to this notion that all the hedonists share that the goal of life is to simply enjoy life as much as is possible given your circumstances. Now, this is a teaching which emerges actually contemporary with uh, Plato. There are these roots in Platon, you know, in that same era, right? And there's an, a North African thinker, a Greek uh, thinker who lives in a Greek colony in North Africa known as Cyrene, who will move from Cyrene to ancient Athens while Socrates is still doing his thing and will be influenced to sort of rethink life by Socrates, but this guy Aristippus of Cyrene, Aristippus the Elder of Cyrene, will produce a, a very different notion of life than what we associate with uh, Socrates and Plato. And then, as I was developing the historical context before, this teaching you know, it will, you know, have some followers, but it won't really get big for another century or so until, you know, you get the, the thinker that comes from a Greek city-state in the coast of modern-day Turkey, the, the Ionian area, the Greek thinker of, uh, uh, Epicurus of Samos, who will, like so many of these thinkers, Aristotle, Aristippus, and Epicurus and, and Zeno, all of them, right, are coming to Athens, right, this sort of cultural mecca, if you will, um, and they're putting forth their ideas there, and Epicurus will come to Athens and put forth his refined versions of hedonist philosophy around the, uh, the, the turn from the fourth to the second, uh, the, uh, four, uh, the third to the second century around um, I'm sorry, the fourth to the third century, this is tough because we're still counting backwards in this weird uh, socially constructed notion of time. Around 300 BCE, Epicurus will turn hedonism into something that becomes really prominent in what I've called before the Hellenic Age or Hellenistic Age. 
and, uh, and he'll start his school known as the garden. But we'll deal with that more in the next lecture. Here in lecture seven, I wanna deal with the origins of hedonist philosophy. I've already tied it back to something that goes back as far as 500 BC in materialistic uh, metaphysics and in atomism. And here around, let's say, maybe 370 or so, uh, 380 or so, uh, we're going to have Aristippus beginning to teach his philosophies uh, to uh, to students back in Northern Africa, including his his daughter Arate, um, uh, and uh, and his daughter will teach these views to her son, who's called Aristippus the Younger. There's some debate about who out of this you know family lineage is most responsible for developing these views. I'm going to give you in this introduction here kind of the simple standard take, which is we attribute most of these ideas to Aristippus the Elder. Uh, but let's just note that Aristippus the Elder, you know, teaches Arte his daughter, and, and she becomes a, a, a proponent of this philosophy. And, uh, and, and so we're going to see a, a kind of a Cyrenaic school of thought, not a formal school, but a Cyrenaic school of thought emerge around these notions, you know, is it Arte, is it Aristippus the Elder, is it Aristippus the Younger that's most influential? Some debate there, but I'll give you the version that talks about Aristippus the Elder as the sort of founder of this uh, school of thought, not a formal school like the Academy or the Lyceum. Okay, again, just a little bit of background on Aristippus. Here's what we think we know of him. Uh, uh, lived in Northern Africa in this Greek colony of Cyrene, apparently a beautiful place to live, uh, but moved to Athens because Athens, you know, was sort of where it was all going on culturally and certainly intellectually, uh, became one of the young people, very, again, like Plato, who was enchanted in the Socratic you know, sort of demolition, if you will, the Socratic method that became Socrates himself and this whole practice of sort of introducing people to non-knowledge and negative wisdom as a part of a, force, a first step in the later pursuit of wisdom. Um, but then after Socrates' execution, Aristippus will go back to Cyrene and he'll develop these thoughts on life, which may have been present prior to the execution of Socrates in his own thinking. We've got some reason to believe that. But here's sort of one of the ways that I try to understand in my own mind and contextualize Aristippus's move, because Aristippus's thoughts are so different from Socrates that, that I've had to try to make sense of how does Aristippus arrive at these hedonist views when uh, Socrates was sort of famously uh, temperate, uh, he was famously moderate in his pursuit of pleasure in life and took very seriously the pursuit of virtue and excellence right to the point where he was willing to die for it, which is not something you're going to see a lot of hedonist philosophers do, if, if any, right? That's going to be inconsistent with their notion that the goal of life is to simply enjoy life. A hedonist philosopher would have tried to get out of trouble, move away, and find some other place to enjoy life. And so how does Aristippus come out of the come out of the followers of Socrates. And here's my take on it. Um, Aristippus seems to have been, you know, have had his thinking and his life sort of really disrupted by the teachings and practices of Socrates in a way that, you know, may have been upsetting, but, but that he ultimately appreciated. And then particularly by the time he witnesses the death of Socrates, the execution of Socrates, again, in this cultural mecca that was Athens in the fourth century, uh, even after its economic and military age had ended, you know, Aristippus is, is made painfully aware of the uncertainty of the course of events in existence. And to say that another way, Aristippus becomes painfully aware of the uncertainty of the future. Um, and I want to sort of leverage this for a moment and, 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 and try to relate this to our own lives, right? Because, you know, many of us have lived through, let's say, 9-11, 2001. We've lived through, uh, you know, the Great Recession, 2008, 2009. Now we're living through this global pandemic of the 
COVID-19, of the coronavirus, and you know, who could have predicted this? Well, you know, apparently many epidemiologists, you know, did, but with that said, um, my point here is that in many ways, you know, what happens in the future is uncertain, right? And, and, and you know, where are you going to be in five years? Where are you going to be in 10 years? Um, you know, you might make some plans, right? And, and I think that that's, that's wise. But if you think you know for sure, you know, I, you know, I got some bad news for you, right? Like life can be, you know, very uncertain. And this is really crucial for understanding the Cyrenaic perspective and the perspective of Aristippus. Because if you focus on, maybe because of certain key experiences you've had in your own life, if you focus on the way in which life is just simply not promised, well, then that is going to focus your attention more on now, right? And if you combine that with a materialist metaphysics and this sort of psychological theory of hedonism that we're just designed like other sentient creatures to enjoy life or to not enjoy life, well, look, we should try to enjoy life now while we can. This becomes sort of the hallmark of Cyrenaic hedonism, is that it is focused on, on enjoying life now as much as possible while we can. Why? Because the future is not promised. Be very skeptical about the cultural messages which tell us to sacrifice ourselves and even be suspicious of the cultural messages which ask us to sacrifice the present for the future. Again, I know that there is some wisdom to this, but I'm trying to be as charitable as possible, as charitable as charitable as possible to the Cyrenaic view and develop this notion for you that if you don't know where you're going to be in 10 years or you're going to be in, uh, you know, in 20 years, then be very careful about saving up your opportunities for experiencing life more fully and more enjoyably for that later period of time. I mean, we don't know what life is going to be like. We don't know if there's going to be an economy, right, in place as, as we know it now. We don't, you know, frankly, if we're honest, a little bit of dark thought, but the, the truth is we don't know we're going to be here in 10 or 20 years. And, you know, I get it when you're, when you're 18, when you're 20 years old, you know, your life energies are just expanding in such a way that it makes it seem like a never ending opportunity. But, um, you know, in some respects, you know, over the next couple of decades, you know, life and entropy and aging and the experiencing of aging will make you aware of the way in which, you know, this does not last forever, right? And life, you know, is, you know, in some sense to be savored uh, and to be experienced. And again, given the metaphysics and given their simple theory of the psyche, you know, at some level, I hope this doesn't sound just crazy because I'm trying to be very charitable to this teaching, you know, look, you have the opportunity to enjoy life and, and you should make the most of that while you can. And so the Cyrenaic philosophy sort of built around maximizing your opportunities for the enjoyment of life while you can. Maximization of pleasure is crucial. And there's two kind of directions for this thinking of how to maximize pleasurable experiences. One is in terms of number of experiences. You want to have as many good times as possible and as a few, a number of bad times as possible, painful times as possible. Again, that's not entirely in your control, right? But I mean, you can direct your life somewhat. And so you make the best of it, enjoy it as much as possible and minimize the pain of existence. Um, and so you're looking for a number of opportunities for a good time. You're also looking for maximizing intensity of experience in terms of pleasure in life. And so if we focus on maximizing our opportunities for pleasure and the intensities of the pleasures that we experience, this is going to take us in the direction of what we might call a sensualism, 
a, a philosophy which focuses on the sort of active cultivation of your senses and your aesthetic experiences in terms of what gives you pleasure. What are the foods that you most enjoy? What is the music that you most enjoy? What kind of humor makes you really laugh and feel good? What is the kind of, what is the beauty that you most enjoy being around? And make sure you maximize your opportunities for these experiences as much as possible. But of course, if we focus in on the intense experiences of pleasure with regard to our sense-based experience, our sensual experience of life, we would, following Aristippus, also ultimately need to focus in on human sexuality as just an opportunity for the experience of pleasure in life that is found sort of nowhere else in existence. Now, just sort of a you know, uh, I don't know quite how to say it, you know, just a prefatory warning here. Let me just say uh, by way of, 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 you know, warning, this is not a lecture for children. This is a lecture for adults wanting to think about existence. And I, I might have argued even in my opening lecture in this series that we cannot meaningfully explore the meaning uh, of a good human life and, and what it might mean to live a good human life if we start off by denying that we're creatures that have great and, and scary capacity for aggression. And let's add, you know, remember our, our, dist, our, our very close genetic relative, the bonobo, we are another type of ape that, like the bonobo, seems to really be into, for the most part, sexuality. Of course, the more we understand about it, the more we see how fluid it is and how nuanced and varied our experiences are in terms of what we enjoy, including, you know, a, a subset of us that are reporting more and more um, a kind of what we might call an asexuality, and that is a you know, maybe a couple different versions of that. Maybe that maybe in some sense, sex is just not that big a deal in our lives. Um, it's, not a, it's not as big a deal to some of us as it is to others. For many of us, though, we are, you know, and we don't talk about this much, we are very sexual creatures, that this is a very natural part of who we are. Um, there's an awful lot of potential pleasure to be found in a kind of a smart cultivation of our of our own awareness right know thyself and you know know yourself as a creature that can experience certain kinds of pleasures and in particular let me go ahead and introduce a kind of a technical term here that scholars of the hedonist tradition have entered into the discourse about hedonism and I'll I'll bring this back up in my lecture on epicurus in lecture 8 you know, there are a series of pleasures that we might call active or positive pleasures. Um, and these pleasures are the kind, these are the pleasures that result from the sort of active response to the positive pleasure, the positive presence of specific urges and desires. Okay, there will be a, a kind of a pleasure that the Epicureans, the, what are called the refined hedonists, will, will explore and, and sort of champion that will be contrasted with this called the negative or passive pleasures, which don't maybe, which we're not drawn towards by the presence of, uh, here, pre positive and negative here just sort of mean presence and absence of something. And what's present for the positive or active pleasures is specific urges and desires. The Cyrenaics are going to be sort of be um, thought of as emphasizing these positive pleasures. And the Epicureans are, will be emphasizing, it will seem, these kind of negative pleasures, which sounds like a strange concept, but the idea there is pleasures that we can experience even though we don't have a kind of a natural urge or desire to experience those pleasures. Mental cultivation, for example, would be big for the Epicureans. We don't have the same kind of urge and desire, kind of tangible ache, right, to mental cultivation that we do, and this is where we, what we were talking about before, that we might experience in ourselves in terms of our sexualities, right? Our, our, our sexualities for many of us sort of present themselves at a certain phase of our hormonal and biological development as a kind of a new complication, but not only a new complication, a new opportunity 
for our different kinds of experiences of life. And once we become consenting adults, right, the opportunity to explore our sexuality in its, you know, maybe many different various manifestations um, is, you know, for the Cyrenaic, right? Like this is who's the Cyrenaic is emphasizing maximization of opportunity and intensity. And so certainly as a part of our overarching sensuality, our sexuality is kind of a special, um, has a special place for the Cyrenaic. And, you know, if you're wondering, Aristippus, I think, definitely sort of walked the walk here. You know, he, he, he backed up his talk on this point and lived a very sort of controversial life, um, a life that, you know, got him a lot of different sort of reputations, perhaps sort of infamous reputations. Um, and the idea here, right, if I flesh that out a little bit, is that, you know, look, complex human societies tend to historically in the last few thousand years put a kind of a cap on, many of them, not all of them, but many of them put a sort of a cap on uh, the celebration of human sexuality. Not all of them, but many of them do. Um, and so Aristippus and the Cyrenaics are going to say, look, the, the virtue of existence, right, that will lead you to this target, this is ultimately a, still a virtue theory, and the target is an enjoyable life. The virtue is your ability to discover what kind of urges and desires you have and to learn how to somewhat safely fulfill them. Now, I say safely fulfill them, right? Aristippus, Aristippus should not be mistaken for a complete fool, right? Even though he's short term in his focus because he's skeptical about the future, he still recognizes the opportunities for things to go way wrong in the short term focus of pleasure, namely the loss of control, uh, what we might call the, the uh, rising of addiction, right? Like the party is over as we become addicted to certain kinds of pleasures. In fact, they stop being pleasures as we become addicted to them, right? And they become, you know, just sort of respite from what is otherwise sort of painful, you know, longing, right? We just, you know, maybe we enjoy, um, let's say, uh, something like nicotine or we enjoy alcohol. Um, and the way it makes us feel. But if we don't exhibit some semblance of control, then the stimulants like nicotine and the, uh, and the depressants like alcohol can very quickly turn into something that's no longer pleasurable, but just absolutely required. So I don't feel like, you know, don't, I don't feel terrible, right? So Aristippus is saying, you know, be careful, right? Like never be owned by your desires and urges. Always sort of take charge of them. But, but nevertheless, a good life is a life where you figure out, and I like to use this language sort of half jokingly, you need to figure out what kind of freak you are and you need to learn how to get your freak safely on, right? Like that is the goal of a Cyrenaic life. And this is about sensuality in general. What are your desires? What are your urges? What are your tastes? And figure out how to get them met. And this also includes as a special subset, your sexuality. And don't let culture be the wet blanket that it can sometimes be. Don't let shame and guilt ruin your capacity to enjoy life and to maximize the enjoyment of life. And here, I would like to be a little bit provocative uh, and explore kind of a contemporary uh, version of this teaching or a, a relevance of this teaching in contemporary culture. I think more and more, the more we systematically study human sexuality, the more we realize how complex it is. But imagine for a second a culture which is condemnatory of homosexuality, whether it's you know, being gay or being lesbian. Imagine the way in which shame and guilt and physical coercion is used to stamp out some people's enjoyment of their sexuality and not only perhaps their sexuality, but more broadly their capacity to receive affection. And then, you know, let's go on, although this gets us beyond the centralism of, of the Cyrenaic school, but also, you know, in terms of who 
who we love, right? And so what a loss that is for some people. Now, consider the possibility as well, and I know this is a little provocative, and I certainly don't have good numbers to back this, but I just want to sort of provoke a little thought in you here. Imagine that it, it's very possible that what we might call heteronormativity, right, which is this tendency of certain cultures to, um, to champion and to put forward here's certain expressions of human sexuality that are permitted and encouraged within certain institutions like marriage. And then here's all these others that are shamed and, uh, and we put guilt upon them and we even respond with violence to them and, and create kind of fear. And what if, for example, you know, as we come to study human sexuality more and more in the 20th and 21st century, what if human sexuality isn't right, and this is currently, I think, what we actually believe, it's not as simple as sort of homosexual or heterosexual, it's perhaps best understood as kind of a spectrum upon which we may even move during our lifetimes in a kind of a fluid experience of our desires and our urges and our orientations. What if, just to say it very simply, what if more of us are more near the center of the spectrum than we might imagine? What if more of us are more bisexual than we might imagine? I think with contemporary science of human sexuality, that's not a crazy thing to say out loud. But I, but I say that out loud in part to sort of get you to see the radical cultural critique that is being offered by the Cyrenaic school. Because if it's true that more of us are perhaps more bisexual, more near the middle of a spectrum here between purely heterosexual in our desires and thoughts and actions and purely homosexual in our desires and thoughts and actions, if more of us are nearer to the middle of the spectrum and society has imprinted, conditioned us, in many cases, literally shamed, guilted, and beaten us into what we might call heteronormativity, well then, you know, there's the Cyrenaic rejection of culture, question culture, know thyself, explore your own urges and desires, and get on with your ability to enjoy your one life while you can. Now, again, I don't want to reduce Cyrenaic philosophy to, you know, you know, to some kind of huge bisexual orgy philosophy, although I very much think that the Cyrenaics would have been completely fine with that. Um, at the same time, you know, it's a, it's a sensualism, right? And it's broader. But some of the more interesting and provocative points come out as we explore one part of our human sensual experience of life uh, and that is we focus on sexuality, and this is allowing us to bring out, I think, some of the best of the critique of, uh, of, that Aristippus and the Cyrenaics offer, and that is that you should be very skeptical of some aspects of culture that turn you away from things that may be totally natural in human existence. And for a variety of maybe reasons of control and reasons of just sort of historical accident, we have been sort of beaten into one expression of human sexuality at the expense of a lot of opportunities, right, for good times. Now, let me be clear about something as well. I don't think that contemporary science of human sexuality bears out that you know that there are no emotional and psychological repercussions to sort of an all-out exploration of your of your sexuality. You know we are, we you know intimacy and including physical intimacy should be taken seriously. But the point here is that it should be taken seriously as an opportunity for the enjoyment of existence. And as long as we have a kind of a thoughtful approach to that, including let's say, and here's another point where we might take something from this ancient Cyrenaic hedonist school and kind of apply it to contemporary society just for something to think about. Is it wise for us to, to treat uh, emerging sexuality, let's say, especially in, in adolescence and or young adults, as something that's to be sort of denied and just said no to? Or might we take a page out of, 
uh, the cultural approaches, you know, that we see in certain places around the world, in particular, I would think maybe the Dutch seem to do a pretty good job of this. And that is that, you know, sexuality is natural and that, you know, we should all be given a kind of a thorough, mature and informative education in human sexuality. And that, you know, the idea that, that we as parents would be too embarrassed uh, to raise our children up in this way um, is a loss right? It's a loss because, according to the Sinaic philosophy, it maybe um, limits the ability of human beings to develop their potentials in such a way that they might get the most enjoyment out of their existence as they become adults later on. Um, and again, let me take this in, in one more, even more provocative direction, and I want you to consider the way in which We've come a long way in the West, I would say, since the sexual revolution in our attitudes towards sex, and we're doing a lot more to sort of understand sex in a mature way. We still don't have a very common, you know, I would say adult, informative, mature level of discourse about this in, uh, in schools. Uh, I, I personally think that this is something that is valid in the critique that the Cyrenaics offer. This is a part of life, we should address it. Um, and so that leaves many of us with this kind of almost schizophrenic attitude towards our own sexuality, where maybe we know we have these urges, but we don't know exactly how to respond to them because we haven't experienced a kind of a thoughtful discourse about it during our upbringing. And then think about the way in which we just pass this on as adults who maybe feel uncomfortable in talking to our you know, children as they're maturing about their own sexualities. And, and because we feel uncomfortable about this, maybe we often kind of go to this unfortunate extreme where we shame any thoughts about sexuality. And consider, for example, the, the sort of dichotomy, even in fairly advanced parts of the world, about the way we talk about sexuality with regard to boys and the way we talk about sexuality with regard to girls. As humans sexually mature, there are cultural narratives that should sound pretty recognizable where we often somewhat celebrate the emergence of sexuality in a boy and becoming a man as a kind of um, you know, appropriate sort of expression of masculinity. And then we shame, again, not always, but often this should sound recognizable in many you know, sort of corners of our culture and in many ways right out in the open. We shame um, and we give guilt to emerging female sexuality in a very different way. And so, you know, on the one hand, we, we celebrate boys as a kind of a, uh, I don't know some of the language. I asked my students, you know, what's the language here? And apparently the language has evolved in some ways that I won't put into this public lecture. But, you know, historically, you know, there's been this notion of sort of celebratory language for male sexuality and then this sort of shaming language for female sexuality. And that has incredible repercussions. I mean, I, of course, there are much more extreme versions of this where, you know, even in parts of the world where a woman is kissed, you know, or, or, or raped, you know, she will end up being killed because somehow she has been made dirty. I mean, that to me is ethically unimaginable, right? And that exists in the world to this day. And then even in what I would think of as sort of uh, more forward thinking societies, we still have this sort of language and vocabulary of celebration of male sexuality and, and shaming of female sexuality, particularly with regard to experimentation and, um, you know, and, and sort of inviting in the Cyrenaic way, you know, multiple safe experiences into your life. And so uh, as the father of daughters, right, this has presented itself as a kind of an interesting challenge. I would like to be open-minded, I would like to be helpful, I would like to be informative, I would like to be thoughtful and mature in the way that I help my girls become young women, recognizing the reality that they are you know, sexual beings, that they will have their own experiences of their very human sexuality, but I certainly don't want to put shame about bodies and guilt about sexual urges 
into their psyches when they're young. But of course, it's challenging, if we're honest about it. It's challenging to navigate in, in the family structures, and it's challenging to navigate within the larger cultural structures and all the mixed messages that we get about our bodies and about sexual desire and about sexual objectification. And I do think in many respects that half of the world's population, namely women, have had a kind of a much, much, much tougher time with regard to this aspect that's being brought out and emphasized by Cyrenaic philosophy. <clears throat> and in some sense, what a loss that is. Um, you know, certain parts of female anatomy, right, are the most nerve dense parts of any human anatomy and seem to only have the function, if I'm, you know, just very direct about it, the, the, the clitoris seems to have the primary function of facilitating, you know, pleasure, right? And look at the irony there, that that's a part of female anatomy, and yet we also, perhaps in our cultures and in our family structures, you know, out of maybe ignorance at best, and sometimes just, well, I, I'm just going to leave it at that. I think sometimes out of ignorance and the lack of a thoughtful dialogue and discourse about sensuality as a whole and sexuality as a subset of that, we, uh, we end up you know, creating a kind of a guilt and a shame about bodies and about sexuality. And you know, let's just expand on that notion about bodies for a second. In our culture, there's plenty of dollars to be made out of shaming people's body types and selling them the diet, the product, the machine that will give you the quote unquote beautiful body. And think about what this does in terms of sensuality, right? This is another cultural manifestation in capitalism, right, in, in particular, that's not a conspiracy, right? But there's money to be made on inducing shame about body structures and selling products in response to that shame. And what does this do to many of us, right? Because at some level, we all have individual bodies. And in some sense, very few of us look like those bodies that we see in these advertisements and on the front of these magazines. And so in some sense, we're all kind of having to drink all the time, unconsciously drink up this shaming about bodies. What does that do to our experience of our sensual existence? Now, I don't know where you are at with regard to uh, the metaphysics of the hedonists, but I always try to find sort of the silver lining uh, through a charitable analysis of a philosophy uh, as best I can. Many of you will think that materialistic metaphysics might be too simple and you'll look for something else in terms of your existence. But I just want to say that even if you end up thinking that materialist metaphysics is somehow too simple, you might still consider the value of the Cyrenaic critique here in terms of what is very natural uh, about our sensuality and more specifically our sexuality and the way in which shame and guilt in particular, unfortunately for a variety of reasons, many of them even economic, are often uh, put upon us in ways that we're just not even aware of um, and then cause us to have a, a kind of a limited ability to enjoy something that it might, I think we have good reason to believe, might be very natural for us to enjoy. Again, always keeping in mind that control is important even for the Cyrenaics. You want to watch out for addiction. You want to watch out for the re very real dangers of, of, of let's say, STDs, uh, sexually transmitted diseases. Um, in some respects, I would say that there are sort of deep biological reasons for some of the um, the inequality in the way that we treat male and female sexuality, and that has to do with the biological reality that many females can get pregnant from certain kinds of sexual activity, right? That there it is, just a fact of, of nature. And in the attempt of societies to control this biological potential of more mouths to be fed in kind of unintended and unthought about ways, you know, maybe this has produced a kind of an, a, an over 
expression of you know caution right like that but caution frankly would be wise if you're female right and it's frankly would be wise for all of us with regard to very real dangers about exploring our sensuality and our sexuality that include you know stds and addictions and pregnancy and frankly just maybe sort of getting our hearts broken uh, because you know especially sharing you know our bodies very physical act a very intimate act um, it's not maybe for many people experienced in quite the same way that we might meet and play tennis right it's just a little it's more intimate than that it requires more trust and vulnerability particularly to be enjoyed thoroughly it requires more trust and vulnerability and so there's just all kinds of reasons why you don't want to be foolish about this and i don't want to paint the cyrenaic school as a kind of a, a foolish short-term focus on pleasure i think that's uncharitable to uh to the philosophy um, and i did make a lot about the sort of way in which this might impact half of humanity in terms of females i i do actually think there's a critique to be offered here in terms of males that even the sort of celebratory narratives that we see in some cultures about male sexuality and particularly the kind of almost militarized language that we often hear about conquesting right and um uh, you know, again, not to get too graphic, but, you know, sort of about hitting this or hitting that, right? Like this language, I think we should be suspicious of that language. In many ways, um, it might threaten to put male sexuality in, in a box that in some ways might be constricting in much, much the same way that the boxes put around female sexuality have been constricting. Um, and again, I hope you maybe have noticed all along that as I talk about males and females, you know, in some ways I've talked about, you know, a kind of a heteronormative context here that should be, that should have been in some ways maybe invisible to some of you. I think that's changed a lot, but keep in mind my earlier points about the possible uh, experience of sexuality as more on a spectrum and more fluid. And if that's the case, then the last thing you want to do, again, let's assume the full-on metaphysics here, is miss your one chance at a life, you know, by throwing away all of these opportunities to explore, to know thyself, and to explore experiences in a safe way that could lead to some very intense enjoyment in existence that might really, in some ways, enrich our existence. So this has been my exploration of Cyrenaic hedonism with a kind of an introduction to hedonism. And my next lecture, I will be talking about the way in which this teaching gets refined about a century later, a little bit less than that, uh, by the uh, thinker Epicurus. And uh, this teaching gets brought into a formal school called the Garden, but we'll explore that next time. And uh, in the meantime, I would invite you to um, consider enjoying your existence as much as you can.